so yeah, I've been really looking forward to this. Um, Laura Vandenberg, um, I don't really have a formal introduction prepared, but, um, but she is uh, the author of, of four books. This is her fourth book, her second novel. Um, she teaches creative writing at Harvard. She lives in Cambridge. She's from Florida. Um, and she is a writer um, that, is, that is really being talked about a lot these days. She is a, she's a writer that, um, that, you know, we're gonna get into the kind of, um, the particulars of this book, um, but uh, my wife and I, since finishing this book, have had great conversations uh, about this, about this book. And that's no surprise. She is a writer who just uh, generates that kind of discussion and involvement. And this book, for those of you who know it, or, or for those of you who are, will soon know it, um, is, is absolutely absorbing and unnerving and vivid and, uh, and smart and, um, and really unlike um, a lot of uh, work that's being done today. So I, I wanted to start our conversation. What I'm hoping for um, tonight is to really listen to Laura talk. Um, I, I think that that's why you're all here. Um, and so I'm gonna try to find ways to, to, to get Laura to talk about the book and about writing in general. And then she's also gonna read um, a, an excerpt from the book. Um, but I wanted to start um, by just maybe more specifically describing my reaction to the book, um, which hopefully will lead to a question that you can answer. But um, so one of the one of the great accomplishments I I think um, uh, that um, you know that this book um, or yeah one of the one of the great accomplishments of this book is that it describes the um, the state of grief, um, and, and particularly that kind of, um, that state of kind of peak grieving, um, when the lens through which you see the world makes everything, um, you know, kind of ultra vivid and, uh, hallucinatory and, um, and fractured, uh, it's, you know, that state when the kind of the world is cracked open, um, because of grief. And I feel like the way that she does that is by, um, is, is in the sentences, really, at the sentence level. So there's, there's a lot about the plot um, that, um, that gets us to that place and the kind of the ideas in the book. But the images, really, for me, um, were what created that, that feeling that, you know, um, that reminded me of moments in my life when I was in that kind of um, that peak grieving um, state. Uh, so this is something I think it's a great achievement of the book is that these sentences um, create this feeling of, of um, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, but that feeling um, of you know, the kind of the air being slightly different uh, and you know things shimmering and and you know, feeling as though um, uh, even mundane things are slightly surreal. So Laura, um, I think in this book, and, and you'll, you know, I, I think you'll, uh, you'll hear it uh, in the sentences that she reads for us, um, achieves that, that, um, that effect um, masterfully. Um, so I wanted, that is my kind of, um, that, that was kind of what I was, I mean, there are many things about this book that I was impressed by, but that was something that I, that I think will really stay with me, is the way that you um, recreated that, that feeling. Um, so I wanna then pivot into asking you, how did this book come to be? Uh, and like, where did, this, where did this come from? Well, thank you. That was a, yeah, a beautiful um, introduction, and thank you to the library for having me, and all of you for coming on a very, very rainy uh, evening. Um, so 
The, the story of how this book came to be is not, it's, it's, a, it's, it's not a short story, uh, and I've, I've really, like, as I've been doing events, I've really tried to condense it, and it's gotten, like, marginally more condensed, but just bear with me. So it's my practice when I'm between projects to keep um, what I call a thought log, which is exactly what it sounds like, uh, just a notebook where I sort of record things that I've been thinking about, or, you know, it's not, it's not like a journal. I'm not, you know, it's my feelings stay largely out of it, uh, but just stuff that where I'm like, this is interesting. I think that there might be something here in terms of fiction. Um, and there are a couple things that kept coming up. Um, horror movies, marriage, uh, ailing elderly parents, and, um, and also travel, both in the context of, of travel for pleasure, professional travel. It was, there was a time where I myself was traveling a lot for events and different things. I'd had my first novel come out, you know, not, not very long ago, and, um, and travel in the context of tourism. Um, and then I also, so I'm from Orlando, Florida, uh, which is a place that's been, you know, where the, both economy and culture has been really powerfully shaped by tourism. So that whole landscape has, has been of interest to me for a long time. And then um, when the travel restrictions um, for Cuba were loosened, um, I became really interested in how those, um, how Havana in particular, because that was the place that was sort of like in every travel magazine, every travel blogger was, you know, was like, I went to Havana, I took an Instagram photo with an old car in the sunset, it was great. Um, and. I became really interested in how the sort of the place was being narrated and who the narration seemed to be for, who it seemed to be explicitly not for, what was being foregrounded, what was being left out, you know, entirely. And for like a million different reasons, Havana and Orlando are not at all comparable contexts, but at the same time, it was a place where I felt some sort of point of entry. And so that kind of came into the thought log. Um, and then it took me sort of a long time to understand how these different kind of concerns or these different landscapes could maybe come to live within the same fictive world. And I went to see a lecture by um, a scholar who's at MIT, who's in Cambridge, um, named Paloma Duong, and she was doing a, uh, giving a lecture on um, consumer culture in contemporary Havana, and she was talking quite a lot about tourism. And I realized I had meanwhile been reading a lot of film theory that the kind of language, the sort of vocabulary that she was using, um, she was talking about you know gazes and lenses and angles and so on, where it was very close to cinematic language. And that was sort of, I mean, there were subsequent like moments of really powerful connection, but that was the first one I remember, where it was to, to sort of see the synergy between like tourism, travel, and film, and to understand how they could kind of speak back to each other. Um, that, I think that was one of sort of the, the first moments where I was like, okay, this could really, I could really like pull all of these different worlds into one macro world. One of the one of the most um, kind of for me gratifying convergences or just kind of over thematic overlaps is um, tourism and traveling and marriage. Um, I, I, I just I I love the way that that you did that. Um, that in, in some ways there's this um, you show the contrast between intimacy or or in both realms there's this contrast of. Um, uh, of intimacy and estrangement, um, and um, in in both the 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 state of being a, a tourist or a traveler and you know being uh, in a marriage, um, I I think that that um, the the kind of uh, when the I actually, how, how do I talk about this without giving away too much? I mean, I don't know how, how much uh, of a spoiler alert we want to have, but um, um, well, so actually, let me let me um, knowing knowing that knowing some some more about the origin of the book, um, let me ask you about um, your experience of um, of Havana because you have been there, right? Yes. yes okay. Um, so. Um, and I remember reading, after having read, maybe it was just in the notes in the back of the Best American Short Stories, but um, I remember after having read that wonderful story of yours, Antarctica, 
learning that, I mean, I guess no surprise you hadn't been to Antarctica, but that then you kind of um, talked about the kind of the energy that you could sometimes get into a story from having not been to the place that you're writing about. Um, and I was really interested in that kind of idea or that concept. Um, and so um, what, what impact did going to Havana have on this story and, and when did you go and did you go after you kind of conceived of this plan or, yeah. yeah. It was very interesting, I mean it was the first time I had done, so I took three research trips to Havana and one, um, so the Claire goes to Havana um, to go to attend a film festival that her husband who was killed in a hit and run cross and under mysterious circumstances had planned to attend so she ends up sort of going in his place. So I made um, I took three research trips to Havana. Um, this was like 2015, 2016, two and two in 2016. Um, and one was to attend the research or the, the film festival that is the basis for the fictional film festival in the novel. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think you know the thing with Antarctica. It, you know, it's it's like stupendously expensive to go to Antarctica. Yeah. And you need like a lot of time. Um, and at the time that I wrote the story, not only did I have that not have that sort of bandwidth in my schedule, but I had like no university funding. You know, so it would be like it, it, it just didn't seem plausible to go to um, to go to Antarctica. And al and also, I think for a short story, the kind of um, the demands in terms of the volume of information you need are different. Um, but I think in this case it was not so much just about the scale of the novel and the demands that the scale of the novel brings. It was also um, at that moment in time, so the novel's pinned in 2015, and at that moment in time certain sort of practical things were kind of shifting so quickly it was actually very difficult to, to find reliable information um, on certain fronts. I mean, just really simple stuff like, you know, uh, visas and, um, and the process in the airport and internet and currency, things like that. Um, you know, if you were setting a novel in 1975, you would have this sort of archival research that you could, you could rely on a little bit more. Um, but this, I think, to try and research into a moment that was happening uh, you know, unspooling like in, in the, you know, very much in the present tense, it, it, that sort of um, information wasn't really available. So it did feel important to me to um, take research trips myself and to move through spaces that Claire was moving through and to move through, you know, the space of the festival specifically and just sort of see like what is what is this? What is this like? And and from from the POV of a traveler slash tourist, what are the procedures like? And so on. Um, but also, I think you know the thing that I came to understand that was really important about the book is that I wanted travel for Claire, um, the narrator, to sort of exist in three different contexts. One context is she was raised by um, innkeepers who managed a hotel in North Florida. So that's her childhood background. So it's like she's been in that position of being the kind of stationary entity that other people travel to and travel around. The second context is her, she, she should sail her up, so as an adult she's traveling all over the Midwest constantly for work. And then the third context is being at this film festival in Havana. And I've experienced um, versions of the other two contexts, you know, in a hands-on sort of way in that, as I said, I you know had written chunks of this novel when I myself was tra traveling a lot um, and moving through transit spaces, which are so interesting. I took the Concord coach up for Boston, and even in that two hours, all manner of fascinating human behavior was like on display. So just I'm sorry, this is a total sidebar. Like there was this tour. So I gleaned that there was this tour group who who I presume lived somewhere in Maine and were coming home from a trip in Amsterdam. And like half of them weren't speaking to each other. And there was this like whole complicated thing going on. Um, so transit spaces of all of all sorts I think are really interesting. And then be, you know the context of being in Florida and being sort of familiar with that world. So it also felt somehow. Um, disbalanced or disproportionate to be like, well, I've I've lived in you know two of these contexts to a certain degree, but I have no sort of physical contact with the third context, and so that yeah, I mean, I, I just sort of 
felt like, um, you know, it was inevitable that some first head contact would bring, you know, layers that were, um, yeah, that were, um, would not be accessible otherwise. Um, and I, I think also being, you know, from Florida too, I mean, you know, I mean, the island as a whole, but Havana even in isolation is like a stupendously complicated place. And I certainly don't presume, you know, any sort of expertise via research and research trips and so on. Um, so I think the thing that, you know, my approach ultimately was to think about where are those places where I do feel that I have a point of entry, the world of film, the world of hotels, the world of tourism, et cetera, and then to really sort of sink down into those areas. And it felt important um, and, and helpful to do that both via, you know, research and contact with other arts mediums and also in sort of a firsthand kind of way. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, and <clears throat> the way that um, Havana is presented to us is through her eyes, so she is someone who is unfamiliar with this place, and so we're kind of like learning about it through, you know, as she's learning about it, and she's making discoveries. And so those moments, I like, I love that little kind of aside about the Malecon and how there used to be rooms inside the wall. So that's a little tidbit that she reads about, and it contributes really nicely to kind of the, that, that part of the book and that, that moment. Um, but it's, it's just something that, you know, she's curious about the place, and she's, so she's discovered that. And so that felt very organic to me. And, but so do you have, so you, did you have a draft of the book? Um, I'm always curious to hear how, how and when writers research um, like did you have kind of a punch list of things that you needed to find out about or or did you I mean you just referred to some of them but but did you also kind of want to just breathe the air and um, yeah things um, I it also occurred to me that I've never I've, I love film but I have no formal training in film and it occurred to me that I've never attended a film festival of any sort and I had no idea how to describe a film festival really yeah, yeah. so just seeing sort of in a peripheral way and I like had tickets but no real that would not like any kind of proper affiliation so I would sort of creep into these media events and just sort of lurk while people were being you know interviewed or panels were going on and, and so on um, so that yeah so I mean the, the film festival was um, was was important um, and yeah and there were some sort of physical places that I wanted to see that I wanted to move around some of it was to just breathe the air um, but the, I, I think almost the place where I, I really got a bit in the weeds with research was film theory I went down I went down so many deep rabbit holes with film theory and then I had like these drafts um, where it was like here is every really neat Thing I've ever learned about film that the characters will monologue about apropos of absolutely nothing. Um, and I had, fr you know, friends essentially tell me, I appreciate that this is really interesting to you. <laughs> <laughs> Just anyone who's ever given a manuscript to like a friend to read, when they when they lead with that, you know whatever follows. <laughs> no, it's like when someone says like I I I don't mean to be offensive, but yeah. <laughs> oh god. Um, so they're like I appreciate that this is really interesting to you, but I'm not sure that it's that interesting to the to the story. Um, and. I, someone had at a, at a different event had asked what I thought was like quite interesting question in the audience where they said, "Okay, you're keeping this thought log, and like, how do you know when? How do you know when um, this is that, that there's something here that could turn into fiction as opposed to just your thoughts or your interests?" Um, and it was a question that I hadn't really considered before, honestly, because those sort of shifts feel somewhat intuitive to me as, as opposed to something that I'm, I'm kind of manufacturing in a, in a more um, conscious or strategic way. But um, after thinking about it for a beat, I realized that there comes a moment where I feel like I'm writing lines or I'm describing things, and it's not my point of view, it's the point of view of a character, or in this case, the point of view of Claire. So it really, I, I really tried to, um, just in general with the research, whether it be about place or film or, 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 or travel or, or some other, you know, some other realm in, entirely, 
to really um, allow those sort of details to, to have sort of life and shape through Claire's perspective. And if they didn't feel organic to her perspective, then they had to sort of, you know, it, it became scaffolding that had to come down, even if I was like, but this is so cool. Like it didn't, it didn't matter ultimately if, if it didn't, um, if it didn't, if it wasn't meaningful for her POV. And then, I mean, the, in in part, the way that the f the film festival and the film theory like actually comes to the reader is through her interaction or thoughts with the uh, or about the the director and the the actress um, and uh, you know her actually attending films and that, that I mean I, I I really liked that part of the book uh, and it and it you know I. I don't know anything about film theory, and, and I actually um, uh, have seen very few horror films. Um, but uh, but I was thinking, um, I know that that Richard, um, uh, the film critic husband, um, is a Hitchcock fan, and I thought a lot about Vertigo while reading the book. Um, and, um, and also um, Mulholland Drive, the David Lynch film. Um, and 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 I thought that um, this, and also Joy Williams, who is I, I just read um, that that piece in in the Atlantic or the interview um, where you discuss like your um, reverence for Joy Williams, who's a writer who, um, like Laura, writes terrific, vivid sentences that are um, that are you know visceral with. Um, with image, um, but she's not someone who always answers all the questions she poses in her writing, and and that was uh, that seems to be kind of a central conceit to how that book operates. Like that uh, that there's a lot that um, that goes unanswered, and there's a lot that the reader is trying to grasp that you know kind of like disappears in thin air. Um, so I, I wonder about, um, I want to just ask you about, um, about like that, um, that kind of storytelling because I, I feel like we are so trained, you know, uh, in this culture to, um, to kind of, uh, to kind of get to have that either happy ending or to have kind of all the threads tied together. So maybe were there, were there um, books that inspired you to take on this challenge? What, like, where, did, where, did, where does that come from? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I love, as, as you gleaned from the Atlantic piece, I mean, I really love Joy Williams. And, and she's a writer, for those of you who don't know her work, you should find her like immediately. Um, and she's a real genius, not using the word, you know, and not using the word in sort of a hyperbolic way. But I mean, she's a very theologically engaged writer. And I think in some ways, the sort of like a central sort of situation of a lot of her characters is that there, there is this, there's this really complicated theological plane sort of vibrating over them. And because they're human with human limitations, they sort of can't grasp the reality of their situation in a way that's both immediate and like profound at the same time, if that makes sense. And so um, I think she's, I think her work is about, um, you know, consciousness in a lot of ways. And what does what consciousness mean in the 21st century and what are the limits of consciousness and so on. I'm, I, I'm aware I'm doing like a terrible job of like, Selling, selling her work. <laughs> there are other things too. There, you know, there's some of it's very like breaking. You know, there, there's a lot of other stuff going on besides consciousness. But, um, but you know, I think if that, yeah, if that's your, if that is essentially your sort of subject, um, then um, it makes sense that you would be comfortable dealing with, you know, a, a high degree of sort of mystery and ambiguity. Um, and I, I, I think I feel I, I myself feel resistant to work that um, w resolves stuff that is really like fundamentally irresolvable. If that makes sense, um, like th there's 
you know, I, I think that, and, uh, that said, that's my reading temperament. I think that there, you know, I'm, I'm absolutely like a literature is a big tent sort of person and, and we read for many different reasons and we find meaning and, and shelter in many different kinds of books. And I, I feel like if someone is reading a book that's a positive thing, even if it's not, even if that book is not something I myself would, would, be, would be drawn toward. But that, um, but I think, I think Williams is a writer where, I mean, she writes with like tremendous insight. There's nothing um, vague or withholding about her writer. I think she gives readers so much. Um, but she's, she has no, like zero interest in resolving um, what cannot be resolved. And she's not going to pretend for us. Um, that those certain questions can be resolved. She's just going to give shape to the question with as much sort of depth and precision and power uh, as, as she can. Um, and because she's Joy Williams, you know, she gives tremendous depth and precision and power to the questions that she's seeking to pose. And so um, I, I, I would not pretend to be at her at a Williamsian level of that sort of task, but I think that I feel, you know, similarly motivated that I'm not really interested in resolving what cannot be resolved. And my sort of project is more thinking about, you know, what are the irresolvable questions that I want to pose with as much shape, precision, and power as possible. Um, at the same time, there are, I mean, there are a number of mysteries in the third hotel, some of which are of the irresolvable nature, and some of which are very resolvable, actually. So there's, there's an actress who goes missing um, over the course of the festival, and there's sort of this open question of like, she missing, what's happened to her, and so on. And that is a mystery that is resolved in pretty definitive terms at the end of the book. And it was really deeply pleasurable to solve some of those mysteries um, and to kind of like do that sort of plot work. So I think that that, um, I don't, you know, I, I, I would like to think that I'm not kind of withholding from readers because, you know, I don't, I haven't taken the time to think about what a potential answer might be, right? Um, and I had drafts like that too, where there were these gaps and things where I'm like, you know, I just didn't know. And I needed to know, and I needed to figure it out, and I needed to put some, some answers on the page. But I think the, the sort of kind of higher order project of um, thinking about uh, fiction as a, as a medium for posing really precisely defined sort of embodied questions versus providing definitive answers is one that resonates with me. I mean, <clears throat> one of the things that, um, you know, when, when, we, when Richard first appears uh, and um, he, as a figure, this is her late husband, you know, uh, appears and then is kind of elusive and we don't, you know, we don't, we're not kind of interacting with him right away. And then in the heart of the book, and this is what I got a chance to talk to my wife a great deal about, there's the center of the book is completely absorbing and enthralling because the two of them are together in this kind of intimate and almost mundane way. Like she's with this person who is dead but not dead and those scenes are amazing. And that's, they're vivid, they're specific, we're seeing what he's doing, she's right next to him. So it's not just like this kind of shadowy ghost and you're like, what's going on? We get to kind of witness up close those I think, um, you know, if you haven't yet started the book, the middle is so great. Uh, um, so, um, uh, so I want to hear a little bit. I'd love to hear a little bit more generally about like how you work um, and like kind of the the rhythm of your of your work life and um, yeah. It, 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 I'll just leave that open ended. I'd love to hear a little bit well, more I'm, about. It. I'm, I'm so grateful to hear that you enjoyed the middle because I think the middle of a novel. I think the middle is the worst. Uh, you know, the beginning, sometimes you have a real feel for the beginning and to launch something, you know, is one thing and then maybe you have sort of a sense of where it might end, but it's like everything hinges on the middle, it, you know, it's like the middle has to sort of realize the promise that's been extended in the opening sections and then of course is what, you know, paves the way for the ending and so on. Um, I think for me with novels, you know, they, because they take the time that they take and even for like a slim book like this, it, 
it is a bigger canvas compared to that of a short story. Um, like practice is so is very um, is very important. I think when I'm writing short fiction, which really is is this sort of way of working is more natural for me, but I found that it just does not get the job done with novels. But when I'm reading on a short story, I'll sort of like bop around where I don't work on it in a few days, and I write a paragraph, and I don't work on it for a week, but then I write a few pages and so on, and then it's sort of like one day you're like, oh, I have a trap, like weird, how did that happen? Um, but novels, I, I find, I try, I've tried to do that with novels, and it was not, um, and it just, it just didn't work. I think um, in order to sort of stay in like the dream of it or to keep thinking the continuous thought, I really need to make contact with the book on a, on a consistent and regular basis. And so ideally that would mean working on it a little bit every day or almost every day, but even if it's taking notes by hand or reading you know, sort of adjacent materials, um, that that it that when I took long breaks, I really lost my way. And there's a little bit, I think, with a novel of like kind of a confidence game too. And I felt like if I took long breaks, I also lost nerve. Because if you stand, you know, too far away from it, you're like, oh, what am I doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is this? That's so it's sort of like you need you need to stay just close enough to keep like the delusion sort of intact. That's um, but there were, uh, and, and I think that there are real pleasures in that, um, that sort of depth of immersion. I mean, I think both for, for the third hotel and for my first novel, Find Me, I feel a real relationship to the central characters where um, it, does, it does feel like they'll be sort of, for better or for worse, will be kind of a part of me always. Um, and, that, and that is a very special feeling and not one that, um, I've, I've necessarily not a kind of relationship I've had with characters that are um, that belong to to short stories that I've written, um, and it's but you know it's also and any like novelist in the room you know I mean it's a very it's like very demanding in its way. It was funny I would spent a chunk of the sort of early part of this past summer in residency and I was only working on short stories and I kept waking up in the morning and thinking like wow like I really feel good and I feel this deep sense of optimism like what's what's why? Um, <laughs> and then I realized it was because I was, you know, I was not working on a long form project. Yeah. Whereas the last residency I did when I was working on this novel, my poor husband, I called, it was a beautiful, beautiful place that was wonderful and very kind. It was not their fault, but like I got into this horrible loop where I was trying to write the ending and I was having a really hard time and I would work through the night and, um, and, and write like in a manic state for you know eight hours and I would fall asleep and I'd wake up in the morning and immediately start reading pages you know and I would go to sleep thinking okay like I've really cracked it and then I would start reading pages and before I mean like two sentences in it would be like oh no <laughs> absolutely have not cracked it and then the loop would repeat itself. And then after I realized I had not cracked it, you know, I would call my poor husband at like six in the morning. He's a writer too, so I mean, he was, he was long suffering. But, I, and I would just cry. I would stand in the woods and just cry. So, so there's that side also. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, it's just, it's like, um, you know, it's. I was telling Lewis when we were before we came on stage that I started. Uh, I started boxing last year, and I'm now obsessed with boxing. Um, but it's like, you know, it's like if you're fighting, you know, you just get, you gotta leave it all on the floor. So I think that. But I think that, yeah, the novel, like it will, like I feel like it will, like for, sort of force you to leave it all on the floor. Like it, I don't think it's a form that really accommodates, um, you know, like like halfwayness. Well, so um, follow-up question on boxing. Uh, yeah. So, so what um, what initially drew you to that, and then what has kept you in that in that practice? And uh, you know, like, what um, what do you what fires fires you up about that? Well, I was feeling very upset about um, a, a wide range of things, both stuff that's happening in the world. As I think, feeling very upset is just like our like our baseline for most of us, 
right now. Um, and also had some difficult stuff, like my dad's been really sick. I mean, I just had some sort of difficult stuff happening in the kind of family, personal realm. And, um, and I tried going to yoga because people were like, this is a good thing and you should go and it will calm your mind. And I'm sure that I'm doing it improperly. But the whole like empty your mind, etc. For me, like at the end of the yoga class, I felt really limber. But it just instead of my mind emptying, it was just like a rising sea of anxiety, <laughs> just sort of filling throughout the class. So at the end of you know an hour or whatever, like my shoulders were loose, but my mind was like. <laughs> So um, I got a rep for a friend from a boxing gym in Boston, and I thought, well, I'll try this out. Um, just also to contextualize this, I've never played a sport of any kind ever. I'm like the, the least sporty person. And so I went, and I didn't know how to wrap my hands. I didn't know how to throw like even like the like jab, like the most sort of basic fundamental punch. Um, but yet, immediately, I was sort of like, I'm so into this, and I felt less upset when yeah. I left, and less like, and less anxious. Um, and I, I think I was, as someone who teaches creative writing, like I became the equivalent of the student who has like no natural aptitude for musicality of sentences or narrative or anything like that. But they were like, but I'll work really hard, and I'll show up, and I'll come to all your office hours. And the coaches were like, oh, you're still here. I guess this is like a thing that, you know, we're, we're like a bit stuck with you. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think you are. Um, and so I started to work with one person, like, you know, fairly seriously and, um, and, and, and you made progress and, and so on. And, but no, it's like, I, I'm, I, I completely love it. And it's all, I mean, there's so, I think there's so much. I mean, a lot of like Catherine Dunn, um, a writer that I, I love, um, I mean, there are many writers have written about sort of the intersections between writing and boxing and um, and my yeah coach who's like 23 his name's Shane he says stuff all the time where I'm j I just and I like ferry it immediately into my <laughs> workshops like once he he said to us that um, there's uh, intensity doesn't matter without precision <laughs> I was like oh yeah that's very salient to to writing writing fiction. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's like I feel like he's like he's providing at least like a like a fifth of the syllabus at this. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. So um, I think we'd all love to hear you read, uh, and so maybe we should do that now. Um, and uh, and then I think after Laura reads for about ten minutes, um, love to to hear questions from you. I mean, I may have some remaining questions as well, but. Um, Okay. Um, just to contextualize this chapter a little bit, this comes, um, this is the second chapter in the novel, and uh, it just tells you a little bit about what was going on between Claire and Richard, um, her horror film scholar husband, before he died. In her former life, Claire was a sales rep for ThyssenKrupp. Her area was elevator technologies, and her territory was the Midwest. She liked the job because it involved an endless amount of travel to seemingly anonymous places. She had been to Nebraska 47 times. What was there to see in Nebraska? A surprising amount, really. She knew where to get the best steak in Omaha. When she cut into it, blood pooled on the white plate. She had seen dawn turn the plains as lustrous and vast as an ocean. Once, late at night, she parked her rental car on the side of the road and walked into a cornfield. She stood on a dirt path, surrounded by dark stalks, and imagined a harrowing chase through the corn that culminated in her murder at the hands of a mass killer with a knife. In the night sky, she spotted the red flash of planes through gossamer clouds, and if she listened very carefully, more carefully than she'd listened to anything in months, or maybe even in years, she was able to make out the dull roar of their passing. She got back into her rental car and drove away and wondered if this was what people meant when they talked about mindfulness. Early in her career, she learned that one of the most important rules of travel was this. 
The answer to nearly everything could be found in the signs. This way to baggage claim, this way to the ticket counter, this way to Cleveland, this way to Omaha, this way to the hotel bar. Travel was one of the few arenas in life where clear and correct direction was so readily at hand. Lately, she had been tasked with selling a new kind of cable to find hotels and high-rise office buildings and factories. This cable was made of carbon fiber and allowed elevators to travel twice as fast as they could with steel. They lived in New Scotland, a town on the outskirts of Albany. In their condominium, she kept a small rolling suitcase in the bedroom closet, stocked with miniature toiletries, exercise clothes, an inflatable neck pillow, and the books she brought with her on every flight, but could never seem to finish. The Two Faces of January by Patricia Highsmith. <laughs> it wasn't an especially long novel, but on plane, she could only read a few paragraphs before the words filled her with a crippling and inexplicable dread, driving the book back down into the depths of her shoulder bag. It was not so much the story that unsettled her, but the hidden things she sensed quivering under the surface. Subtext, she supposed this was called, and she did not care for it. Every time she saw her suitcase in the bedroom closet, tucked behind a mesh laundry bin, she imagined it was waiting for her second secret self. She traveled so frequently, it was not uncommon for her to wake in the middle of the night and think for a moment, where am I? She did not find this disconcerting, even when it happened in her own bed, but once she made the mistake of mentioning those midnight thoughts to her husband, and he looked at her like she was terminally ill. The travel had long been a point of contention between them. Why bother being married if you're always leaving? A reasonable question, and she couldn't say that she had an answer beyond the demands of her work. She wanted to be married and she wanted to leave. The two did not seem mutually exclusive. She had this second secret self that she didn't know how to share with anyone and when alone, that self came out into the open. In the months before his death, her husband's own secret self started coming out into the open too. She could only assume this other self had been waiting inside him all along. The year of the great change, she was the same and he was different. The way he looked when asleep changed. His face used to be smooth and expressionless, almost mask-like. But then one night she found him sleeping with lips parted into a wide, unsettling smile. He switched coffee mugs, trading out the exorcist for the ghoulish face of Michael Myers. He was newly skittish around dogs. He stopped adding salt to his food. He stopped eating bananas. His pace on the sidewalk changed. He used to be a brisk, impatient walker, and then one day he began moving so slowly and contemplatively, it was as though every tree branch was a source of wonder. Claire struggled to imagine what, 40 years into a life, would cause a person to suddenly change the way they walked. There were alien, interminable silences when she called from the road, and when she was home, he took long, solitary strolls in the evening hours, a symptom that would eventually lead to his demise. Another symptom. He started demanding to know what she did on the road, how she accounted for all those hours alone, no matter how many times she told him the simple truth. In a hotel room, her favorite thing in all the world was to switch off every light and everything that made a sound, TV, phone, air conditioner, faucets, and sit naked on the polyester comforter and count the breaths as they left her body. Naked, her husband would shout, as though she had provided him with damning evidence. He had been an angry person for as long as she had known him, but it was a secretive anger. Most people found him loose and lighthearted, easygoing. That was the word people used. And in time, she became suspicious of anyone who could be described in such terms. What was so easy about going? Naked and alone, she would say back. Naked and alone. As a married couple, they'd had perfect years and they'd had shit years, but she had never in her life experienced a year that so thoroughly dismantled her with confusion. On her next trip, she thought about what he would see if he ever were to trail her on the road. A woman marking up sales reports with a pink highlighter. A woman watching workout infomercials with the volume on mute. 
A woman eating room service quesadillas in the bathtub instead of reading that novel she claimed to be nearly finished with. A woman doing a little exercise routine, squats and sit-ups, bicep curls with bottled waters, completed with the hope that he would notice the smooth lines when he put his hands on her body. A woman breathing naked on the toilet seat. A woman breathing naked in an armchair. A woman breathing naked before the bathroom mirror in the kind of lighting that can make a person reconsider every choice they had ever made in life. A woman breathing naked in the dark. Torture the women, Hitchcock was reported to have said when a young director asked him for advice. Claire never did have an affair on the road, but she did accumulate a lot of secrets about the odd things she had heard and seen. There were the dentures she discovered in the back pocket on a flight to Toledo, later removed by a flight attendant wearing blue rubber gloves. People, the flight attendant said, the imposter teeth suspended between her fingers. The Midwestern hotels that could have belonged to a horror set with their fluorescent hallways and lurching elevators and the eerie rattle of the ice machine in the middle of the night. The phone that rang on the hour in Wichita when she picked up, no one was on the line. The receptionist in Cincinnati who told Claire that once a woman fell into such a deep sleep in this hotel, she never woke up. She didn't die, the receptionist clarified, slipping a room key into its little envelope but went into some kind of coma and was taken out on a stretcher to a hospital somewhere and would likely be in this hospital for the rest of her life on account of her having never woken up. I don't think that story is good for business, Claire said, as she took her room key. The receptionist shrugged. The name tag pinned to her blouse read Samantha. The more Claire looked at the tag, the more she got the uneasy feeling that Samantha was not her real name. Some people think it's the best story they ever heard, Samantha, not Samantha, said. The very strangest thing happened in a hotel room in Omaha in her beloved state of Nebraska. She opened the bedside drawer and next to the King James Bible lay a fingernail, so small that it could have only belonged to a pinky but fully intact and flawless in its shape. Her first impulse was to pick up the nail and swallow it. A thought so startling, she slammed the drawers shut and turned on the TV and tried to watch an episode of Law and Order in which a man was suspected of killing both his first and second wives. Even though the cops found hard evidence, the killer ended up going free on a legal technicality and marrying for the third time. She couldn't forget about the fingernail. She fell asleep with the drawer open and all through the night she would wake up and turn on the bedside lamp and peer down at the nail. The light gave it a pearly translucence, made it look like a precious thing on display. In hotels, she tried to be a respectful guest. Before leaving, she closed all the drawers and piled up the towels in the bathroom and recycled the paper coffee cups, but that morning she found she could not close the bedside drawer, could not seal the nail up in darkness again. As she wheeled her suitcase into the carpeted hall, she wondered what kind of person would abandon to a hotel room drawer such a perfect specimen of their existence. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Where did the, where did the fingernail come from? That it, was, ha uh, it happened, that's a real, yeah, it was an acrylic nail, not just like a straight up fingernail, <laughs> but still. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it was just right on through like, you know, it was like a basketball or something. Actually, oh, I think it might have been in Maine. Um, so there was a period of time, I taught at Colby for a bit, and I was commuting from Massachusetts to Waterville, and, um, and I had my puppy, who now is like an 80 pound dog, but I would take my puppy and, um, we, uh, yeah, we, we spent a lot of um, nights in hotels in central Maine. And I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was in Maine, actually. But uh, it, yeah, it was just right there. So this, this excerpt, I mean, I think this is, this is one of the things that the book does so well is provides that commentary about like what it means to know someone. Um, and uh, that, uh, um, you know the the kind of intimacy versus estrangement um, in that in that marriage. Um, I, I like how 
you, um, when, the, when the detective asks her um, to describe their marriage, she has kind of this long list of, of intimate kind of um, quotidian things. Um, but she realizes as she's listing off all of these things that, she, you know, these particulars of, of her marriage, she's like, well, what, what does that all add up to? Um, so, um, so questions from you all. I'd love to hear um, any, any questions that, that Brock or uh, Cece have uh, for, for Laura. <laughs> Congratulations on doing it in less than 300 pages. Uh, but I'm wondering if that was part of the voice to begin with, or whether that was something you came upon as other things you felt like. Yeah, I think this, the kind of dream state slash nightmare state um, that you know could accurately describe much of the novel. I mean, I think that I, I also also love the unconsoled. Um, and I, and I love books that operate in that sort of another realm between sort of awake and asleep, you know, living and dead, et cetera. Just the, the, the liminality of, the, of those sorts of books has always been really um, appealing to me as a reader and thus, thus uh, as a writer. But, uh, but I also think a lot of the influence came from horror, you know what I mean? I think in some ways, you know, the most artful, um, examples of the genre use these sort of extreme dislocations of reality and 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 plunge characters into these kind of hallucinatory nightmare states in the service of accessing um, you know human material that's really like fundamental um, and vital and so I wanted to sort of explore using some similar devices to create that kind of effect in the context of a novel Other questions? So did you eat your fingernail? Um, I did not. Yeah, that, so that would be an example, like a thought log example of that wasn't something that I personally felt a compulsion to do. Uh, but it, it like immediately I was like, maybe, you know, maybe Claire would. That, it was a very, it's a strange, it's a, it's a hazy border, right? Because I mean, of course you're inventing the character. It's not like it's, you know, some real world person that sort of, you know, like walked out and, and um, you know, plopped down in the center of your life. But it's, it's, it's this very kind of like fine, night hazy thing of sort of delineating like a consciousness that's come from your consciousness, but is also separate in its way. That actually was my question, um, but I appreciate that you <laughs> You said something earlier that I thought was really interesting, you know, we often hear write what you know, but you said something about points of entry that I think is, I think, probably different than writing what you know in a really meaningful way. Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, I think this idea of like what we know is also sort of, I, I think sometimes the way that that advice is proffered and the way that we might hear it is sort of like, like literally write what you know. So for, for me, if I grew up, you know, I was like, okay, what do I know? At a certain moment in my life, now I've come to know more things like dogs and, and boxing and, and New England um, and, and mo you know, hotels in, in Waterville. But yeah, at a certain time, I was like really sort of alarmed by that advice because I was like, okay, I know like hurricanes, malls, parking lots, like, how to roll cigarettes, like it was <laughs> like really bad boyfriends. Like it was like a, it was a, it was a fairly short list. Um, so I think it took me a while to understand that like what we know is sort of a, a spectrum. And I think of that that um, so there's the stuff that we you know we, we can immediately identify like these are sort of worlds or or realms of experience that we feel like we know with with some degree of intimacy. But I think, you know, often of that Joan Didion line where I have to write to know what I think. And I think one really powerful 
experience um, that's adjacent to, to writing fiction is that you write, you end up writing into all the stuff. I am terrified I'm going to sound like Donald Rumsfeld. Um, you end up writing into all the stuff that you didn't know that you knew. Um, that's the. <laughs> But we know, what we know we don't know, what we don't know we don't know. But there is the like what we don't know, what we don't know we don't know for, you know, for fiction. And so you end up writing into all this stuff where you're like, oh wow, I actually didn't re realize that this was contained within me. I didn't realize that I, I knew it. Maybe I wasn't prepared to reckon with the fact that I knew it. I think that can be a real thing also. But like it turns out that I, I do, I am, and I, I, you know, I do and I am. Um, but I also think that for me it's sort of important to write into what I, what I want to know um, and what interests me about, about the world at large and to invent, you know, to invent stuff that's, that is outside of my own lived experience. But I think for me it's this, there's this sort of overlapping, you know, these kind of like, this like Venn diagram of, you know, what is your sort of experiential realm, what is not, and, and where do those circles kind of overlap, and like that's your point of entry. And it's certainly not to suggest that that's how it always has to work, but I think for me, if there's not that kind of then overlap, um, then it might be, it still f can feel personally interesting to me, or important, um, or something that I'm interested in reading other writers write about, but it's not necessarily something that I'm inclined to approach myself in the context of my own fiction. I've been uh, thinking a lot about performance lately, and I loved your reading. And as a reading, it brought me into a space that was like reading, like reading a book myself, but also brings you into another. So I'm just curious how that, how I don't know, how performance is important to you as you're making this stuff. Is it important at all to you think about it? Is it what we're doing or what? Yeah. Um. Oh my. Well, I think, I mean, sound is important to me. I, you know, I do read my work, you know, I read, a, read novels aloud over and over and over again, so I think the kind of musicality of sentences and the sounds of sentences um, matter to me a, a great deal, and, you know, it's my hope that that sort of carries over into a reading context. Um, but I really, you know, I really admire writers, oh, it was inevitable. Um, I really admire writers who are, who have, you know, where it's sort of like they step onto stage and they become kind of a slightly different person and that performance um, context is, is, is really like an important part of their art form or an important part of their medium. Um, I don't necessarily, would not necessarily sort of slot myself into that group, but, but I do think a lot about sort of sound and rhythm and how things sound aloud. Um, so, and yeah, I think that might be the best, the best answer that I have. You're, very, you're, a, good, you're a good performer, but you know, whatever uh, is not going on. You know, that's all I got. <laughs> that's, that's good, thank you. <laughs> um, I think I read something recently about the, the title story of your first collection is going to be a movie. Is that happening? And could you talk a little bit more? Yeah, of course. Um, so the titles, the title story of my first collection, um, which came out at just a little less than ten years ago, call, is called um, the story is called "What the World" and the collection is called "What the World Will Look Like When All the Water Leaves Us." Um, and this is a, this is a very interesting story. I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I, I sort of I don't know that much about the film world, so it's like my first kind of contact with it. Um, but my understanding is that. Very often when literary works are optioned, it's optioned by a really famous actor, by a studio, and then sort of that's like the first kind of domino and the process unfurls from there. And, and this process um, went in kind of the opposite direction where uh, it's, it's actually a former classmate of mine, um, my MFA program, who had stopped writing fiction but who had become a screenwriter, re reached out uh, maybe like four or five years ago, quite a while ago, and said, you know, I, I've, oh, I, I've been thinking about the story, and thinking about the story, and thinking about the story. I, I would really love to adapt it. Will you like let me take a crack at it? And she talked to my film agent, and they decided. You know, they sort of came to an agreement. And then over time, she attached um, a producer and a really wonderful um, director, Australian director named Claire McCarthy, and they just sort of built this project very, very slowly. 
And then um, uh, Naomi Watts, uh, earlier this year, came on board to play the lead, and they um, premiered, not that they haven't shot the film yet, but the sort of project premiered at um, Con and, you know, was funded and, and so on. So I, I, I think, that I believe their plan is to begin shooting next, um, or I guess it would now be summer's over, I've heard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm in denial, the tomatoes still taste really good, so whatever. But, uh, but I guess it would, I can't say next summer, but like this, this most recent, com summer of 2019, um, I, I had a friend who works in film tell me once that uh, making a film is like playing Jenga in a wind tunnel, but every piece costs $5 million. <laughs> so um, I, my understanding is sort of like you can't know for sure until it's actually, you know, been, been shot, but, um, but that's where things stand presently. Yeah, so it's about a, um, a, prim a, a primatologist, um, an American primatologist who's working in Madagascar and has been sort of dragging her teenage daughter around with her and they, their relationship um, reaches kind of a breaking point during that time. So I think um, they're planning to shoot in Madagascar and in, uh, also in South Africa. Yeah, okay, I have like genres of, um, I'll try and, again, this is something I've, I've been like working to condense. So I think um, Halloween, the original Halloween, like each incarnation gets worse, you know, uh, uh, with each installment, but the original Halloween is like a stone cold masterpiece. It was actually a film that in the context of this book where I wanted to think, I was thinking a lot about the spatial dimensions and how, the spatial dimensions could become sort of increasingly claustrophobic. Um, Halloween is like the use of space and the way the spatial possibilities like winnow and winnow and winnow over the course of the film. I would say that that more than like Michael Myers even is the source of sort of terror and dread and I love that you're nodding. You're like, you're totally with me, fantastic. Um, is like the real source of terror and dread. But that is, I mean, just structurally, it's, an inc it's incredible. It's an incredible, like the structure of that movie is just flawless. Um, and, uh, and it's, you know, it, it, it's sort of remarkable to me that say for the opening sequence, you know, it's 85 minutes long, so it's super tight, right? Very short, and like no one dies for 55 minutes. It's like three quarters, just it, like art of anticipation and then you get this kind of unleashing in the you know in the in the last in the last stretch. Um, so uh, obviously, I have passionate feelings about Halloween. Um, I feel very complicated about Hitchcock, and I feel like very complicated feelings about feeling like Hitchcock has been a sort of important influence. But I think Vertigo is, is a pretty exceptional movie. I feel, for similar reasons, very complicated about Kubrick. Um, Kubrick, but uh, you know, The Shining certainly. Um, and I love, um, I think it's been really exciting to see a kind of wave of women who are writing and directing horror. And um, one of my like favorite more recent horror movies that it, I think to me is just sort of like the pinnacle of what the genre can do in sort of the more psychological realm is Jennifer Kent's The Babadook, um, which is terrifying. Um, but she, she maintains this sort of beautiful ambiguity about, you know, it, is the family actually being menaced by this creature or has the emotional weather of these two characters, mother and son, who are under sort of extraordinary amounts of pressure conjured this, this sort of force? Um, or, or, or can both of those things be true simultaneously? And I think it's an incredible movie. Um, but I think with like that movie, a girl walks home at, alone at night, um, and you know, in some other directors, it's like we're 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 seeing not just kind of like pseudo feminist horror, which they're the, in, those incarnations with kind of the slasher and the final girl and so on, but like like true feminist narratives in horror, and it's exciting, and I want to see more of it. <laughs>